I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? I've got a home in that rock just beyond the mountaintop. I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? Well, Jesus is that rock, don't you see? Jesus is that rock, don't you see? Jesus Christ is that rock just beyond the mountain top. I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? Well, there's love in that rock, don't you see? There's love in that rock, don't you see? Well, there's love in that rock just beyond the mountain top. I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? Well, there's joy in that rock, don't you see? Well, there's joy in that rock, don't you see? Well, there's joy in that rock just beyond the mountain top. I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? I've got a home in that rock just beyond the mountain top. I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? I thank God for that rock, don't you see? I thank God for that rock, don't you see? I thank God for that rock just beyond the mountain top. I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? Oh, I got a home in that rock, don't you see? I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? I've got a home in that rock just beyond the mountain top. I've got a home in that rock, don't you see? Thank God for Jesus. Call home, amen. amen. Able to come into these doors, amen. And you know, I think of, I often think about what a privilege we have. We're reminded on a monthly basis up in Sunday school when we read out of the, the Voice of the Martyrs magazines that we get. And, you know, reminded often how, how blessed we are just to be able to come here. I don't have to worry about, uh, well, we were reminded last week when our brother from Haiti came, we don't have to fear coming to this house. We don't have to fear what, what kind of persecution we might face when we exit out this building or, or putting our homes in danger of being burned or putting targets on our back because we're, we're claiming the name of Christ, amen, or calling on the name of Christ. Yeah. Uh, we have a beautiful privilege to be able to do that where many don't. But I tell you what, uh, I want to encourage you to keep on praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world because uh, they don't have that freedom. Uh, don't pray that necessarily the persecution go away because I found through the reading of the word and the reading of many of those stories that that's how faith is built. That's how the kingdom of God is spread. When we read in Acts, it says that, uh, uh, that they began to wreak havoc on the church and you started to see the gospel really spread after that. So, you know, persecution, it's viewed as a bad thing. No, no doubt it's not desired. It's not pleasant. It's not comforting. Uh, but it is something Jesus said, we would run into That's right. and it's through persecution that the church can grow that yeah. the gospel can be spread that the love of God can really be put on display for yeah. the world to see so pray that God would use them through that persecution yeah. amen uh, but let's go to the book of Philippians tonight Philippians chapter 4 I only got one verse here, and then we're going to go to a few other places. But here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, he says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
I'll just read that one more time. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven above, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for being uh, an ever-present help in a time of trouble. Uh, Lord, this world looks to many other things, and uh, Lord, you've called us to look to you. Uh, Jimmy already quoted the scripture where he says, you told us, uh, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Father, help us to come to you, Father, as, as, as your dear, dear children. I ask that you'd open up our ears to receive your word tonight. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Paul's writing to the Philippians here, and, and, and he's encouraging them. God's going to supply your needs. He's going to supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And, you know, the church then had many different needs than, say, what we might have now. Yeah. You know, it was a different time, a different place. They were experiencing persecutions in ways that we here in America don't experience. You know, they had many needs. But Paul wanted them to, be know, to know and to be assured that God's going to supply those needs. Whatever those needs might be, you might feel like you have little. You know, Sister Lillian sung that song, and thank you uh, for, for answering my request, sis. But, but the line in the song where it says, I know I'm not wealthy and these clothes aren't new, I don't have much money, but Lord, I have you. You know that there's a lot of lackings in this life, but Christ is there to supply our needs. Amen. And Paul wanted the church there in Philippi to know God will supply all your need according to to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And, you know, just as Philippi had a multitude of different needs, we in this life are faced with constant needs, right? Amen. We have needs all the time in this life. We have our basic needs. You know, we need food, we need water, we need shelter, we need clothes. We need these things. Yeah. Well, and depending on the culture you're in and everything, well, those needs are going to now stem into other needs that you have. Well, if we're going to have food and clothes and water and all that stuff. Well, now we need a job. We need a source of income. We, so the needs begin to compile. Not only that, you have those surprises that we preached on not too long ago that pop up. You got needs that pop up unexpectedly, amen, that you're not expecting, right? Those surprises. So, so needs are constantly coming. Many are our needs, amen. But Paul says it doesn't matter what they are. It doesn't matter how many they are. But Christ will supply him. God will supply him through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, it makes me think, though, of, you know, God's got a lot of promises for us. And I like those promises. But one of my favorite promises that I look to, and not, one being that, you know, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's a comfort to me. How about you? Amen. I'm glad that, you know, I, I, can, I, can, I can suffer a lot of loss in this life. And I can have a lot of people walk out on me. Shonda might decide to walk up and walk out tomorrow and, and I pray she doesn't she's not going to do that but she could right she could Jesus says y'all are going to forsake me when the disciples are there he, right before he went up to be crucified all his disciples he said you're going to forsake me he said yet I'm not alone amen he says I won't forsake you this world might turn their back on you this world might not follow amen or stick with you but I'm going to stick with you until the very end that's one promise I like but another one that I like is in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 if you'll flip there with me I'm, I'm going to read more out of Matthew chapter 6 here but particularly verse 33 he says seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. That's a promise from God. That is a promise from God. He says, I'm going to meet your needs. He says, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, he says, you make this a priority in your life. Amen. You don't have to worry about these other needs. And we'll get into it, but he's talking about your food, your clothes, the needs that you have on a daily basis. He says, I'm going to take care of that. That's a promise that we can go to the bank on, amen? We can, we can stand on that promise and know he's going to do what he said he's going to do, amen? He's going to stand by his word and he's going to meet those needs. But I want to back up. In Matthew 
chapter 6, verse 8, he says, For your Father knoweth what things you have need of before we even ask. He knows our needs. Kind of covered that last time I preached about how he knows all about us and he knows the very needs that we have. Not just our thoughts that when they're far off, amen. He knows what we need. He knows them better than what we know it, to be honest. Amen. But he says he knows before we even ask it, he knows what those needs are. Amen. But let's pick up in verse 19. He says, he says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. That's right. He's saying, don't be putting your treasures here. Don't be making all your investments right. here in this life. Why? Because there's a life to come. That's right. much more important. Yes, For one, right. it's a lot longer. Yes. So uh, eternity, compared to our 70-year, 80-year life, whatever that is, no comparison. So it's a lot longer, right? He says, don't make your investments for this life. Right. Amen. Now, I know there's people that have 401ks. I know there's people that make investments in the stock market. I, and I'm not saying that's a wrong thing to do. But we're talking about a setting of priorities. Where's your priorities at? And he says, don't lay up your treasures here on this earth. Don't lay up your treasures here on earth. But he goes on, he says in verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Amen. He says, there's something better to invest your life in. Amen. And I'm not just talking about money, but it might be money. But investing your resources, investing your time, investing your, your, your mental faculties into putting your meditation on and thought on. You know, a lot of people invest in, in football. They're just watching the game. They're just watching the game. And I'm not saying watching the football game's wrong. Amen. But there's a lot of people that they give their life unto it. Amen. It, again, it comes back down to the priorities. I've been investing a lot of time myself into building a deck. I've got a deck that I want built, and, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm not going to deny that. Amen. But it don't need to become my priority. It don't need to become my priority. Amen. So we're, it's about where our focus is, where our priority is, amen. And it doesn't need to be on investing on things in this earth because guess what? For one, you don't know if tomorrow will ever come. I could put all that I have into building that deck and then finish it and say, ha, ah, and then fall down and have a heart attack and die. And I wasted all that time because I was focused on something that didn't matter, that I'd never get to enjoy. But guess what? When I make something a priority in my life that lasts forever, something to do with the kingdom, amen, I'm not going to regret whatever time I've invested into that, amen? And I promise you, when you invest whatever it is into the kingdom of God, you'll never regret that. You'll never regret that. In fact, he says, guess what? You're going to see that in heaven one day. You're going to see the effects of your investment because you're laying up treasure in heaven and you're going to go to heaven and see that there, amen? I want to put my investments there. So when I invest time in reading the word of God, that's an investment in the kingdom of God, by the way. I invest in that. Why? Because I'm growing spiritually. And when I'm growing, I, I, I'm equipping myself through the Word of God yes, for God to be able to Praise use, God. amen, to minister to somebody else, to bring the gospel yes, into somebody Lord. else's life. Praise Guess what? You're laying up in Lord treasures God. in heaven when you yes, do that. Because if you lead somebody yes, to Christ, let it be known if somebody converts a sinner, amen, that they yes. save a soul. That's what yes, he tells Lord. us in the book of James. There's treasure in heaven right there. He said, don't lay up your treasure in heaven. Don't lay up your, or don't lay up your treasure on earth, but lay up your treasure in heaven. Amen. Yes. Invest in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will where your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body is full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Amen. And if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Amen. You cannot serve God and mammon or, or wealth. But it comes down, what it's talking about is our investments and our priorities right here. You know, we can, we can have ambitions and everything in this life. That's fine. We can have aspirations for this life. You can talk to the people who knew me when I was still in high school. I got a high school friend here tonight, uh, 
not, not, I'm not talking about Shonda. She's my high school friend, too. She's my high school sweetheart. But uh, people who knew me then, and many of y'all knew me then, I had a great aspiration, if I'm even using that word in the right context. Am I please somebody tell me I'm using that word right? Shonda? Okay. <laughs> but I had great aspirations of joining the military and joining the Marine Corps. God said, that's cute. <laughs> and he changed those plans for me. I didn't get to live that out, but that's fine. And guess what? I don't regret it a bit by going God's way and not going my way. And again, you won't regret it. When you lay self to the side, you're not losing out on a thing. I I, I just want to promise you that. I promise you that. And I can say I've learned that from experience. I've learned that from experience. But he goes on, you know, and and when we get to the point where we realize what verses 19 through 24 is telling us, you know, and and that's what it's talking about when he's talking about the light of the body, the the eyes and everything. It's where our focus is, right? Where your eyes are set is where you're going to be working towards, where you're going to be striving towards, amen? So focus your eyes on things above and not on things beneath is what he's saying, right? But when we understand verses 19 through 24 and we realize, okay, it's not about what I want. It's not about all these other things in life and I need to be working towards the kingdom. You you realize, well, well, I do have needs, right? I do have needs. And if I'm constantly working, you know, uh, towards the things of the kingdom of God and and I'm constantly doing this, I'm in the word, I'm praying, um, but I got to work. I got to have a job. I got to, you, you start to realize, well, there's still needs that need to be met. Well, God addresses that concern or that question that arises once you get through, through understanding 19 through 24. And he picks up in 25. He says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Okay. We got the ambitions and everything else out of the way. Put the kingdom of God first, but now your needs Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or what uh, yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Amen. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. They're not out there farming and cultivating the land and everything like that, right? Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Amen. Are ye not much better than they? Amen. Sometimes when Praise I God. see my own sin, I think I'm not too much better. But God has assured me, God has assured me that, well, He says we're the ones created in His image. Yeah. Amen. The answer Praise to that question God. is yes, we are much Praise better God. than sparrows. Yet God takes care of the sparrows. Praise and if He's going to take care of su- such good care, yeah. when they don't prepare, when they don't do any of that, amen, He yeah. takes such good care of them. How much better will he take care of his children? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Which of you, by taking thought, can add to one add one cubit unto a statue? None of us. What are you going to change by worrying? Is what he's saying. You're not going to change a thing. That's exactly right. You're not going to change a thing. You might get some more gray hair. You you might. Take a little years off of your life if you worry too much about it. It's not too good on the heart. That's about the only thing you're going to change, but it's not going to be to the positive. It's not going to be to the benefit. Amen? He says, what good are you going to do? What difference is it going to make by worrying? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Amen? Amen. God knows how to clothe us. God knows how to feed us. There's times where I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how that's going to happen. But when I put it in God's hand, He's already promised I'm going to take care of it. There's been times I'm like, I don't know financially. I don't know how these figures all work out together. But He's going to make it work. And guess what? He always has. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Got, I, I bought a house. Two months later, I got married. Two months later, I got laid off. I don't know how it's going to work, God. But he made a way. Amen. Last time I got laid off from a job, I almost got excited. As weird as that sounds, 
And that's not bragging on me. Oh, Will, you've got such great faith. No, it's just God was working in it. And, and I was excited because I wanted to see what God was going to do. Because the Holy Spirit showed up and he said, don't you dare start worrying now. I'm right here. I've not left you. Thank God he shows up. We ain't got nothing to worry about. We ain't got nothing to worry about. He knows how to take care of his own. Amen. I'm about halfway through my first page. (laughs) Verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass in the field, which which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or withal uh, shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, or the non-believing world seeks. Amen. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Again, he knows before we even ask what we're in need of. Now does that mean we don't ask? No. He says, you have not because you ask not. Amen. Absolutely. Ask God. Amen. You have a need, bring it to him. He wants Amen. you to cry out to him. Amen. Amen. You know, there's been times where, where my children will expect something from me, and they'll get, they'll get upset, or maybe not necessarily them, but people will expect stuff from you. Amen. And they'll, they'll get mad. It's like, well, you didn't do this for me, or you didn't give me this. It's like... Did you even ask? I, I'd have been happy to give it to you, but you didn't even ask. And they, they expect it. I, I, I remember my brother, he, he'd wait at the dinner table. He'd start tapping his foot or something, he'd get mad. And finally, Mom would speak up and say, well, what's the matter with you? He said, nobody's passing me the salt. You never asked for it. <laughs> ask. God wants you to ask. Reach out and ask. We aren't mind readers. I know God is. He knows it. But he still wants us to ask, okay? He still wants us. Because you know what asking does? Asking is a first step in a display of faith. Yes, Lord. Right? Praise God. Yes, Lord. How many times have my children maybe avoided asking me something because they said, well, he's just going to say no. I mean, they still ask me sometimes, even when they know I'm going to say no, yeah. just in hopes that maybe he'll say yes. But if we don't ask, it's almost as though it's a display that we don't believe he'll do it. So asking is a first step in displaying yeah, faith Lord. or showing faith. Ask. Ask. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Going back to 19 through 24. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And that's where it really puts it in perspective. First. Priority number one. Priority number one. And boy, am I guilty of letting the kingdom of God come down from priority number one to priority two, three, four, somewhere on down the list. Man, it needs to stay number one. And I'm glad, you know, God is better than what we can ever imagine. Because he's got that precious promise right there where he says, if you keep me number one, I'll take care of these things. Well, there's been plenty of times in my life where I didn't keep the kingdom of God as number one. It fell down to two, three, four, five. And guess what? He still provided. He upheld his end of the promise even though I didn't do quite what I was supposed to be doing. He's better to us than what we deserve. He's much better than, to us than what we deserve. There's distractions in this life, church. We got an enemy that's constantly trying to shift our focus to one thing to the other. And it doesn't matter what it is, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Just as long as it's not on him, that's all the the enemy cares about. Because if our focus isn't on him, amen, then we're not making advancements for the kingdom of God. Right? He's trapping us. Keep your focus on him. I want to look to a few other scriptures real quick. And we're going to go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 5. And I'll try try to be quick through this. I don't want to keep you too long. Mark chapter 5. Starting 
starting at verse 24, he says, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garments. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and thou sayest, Who touched me? Everybody's touching you, Jesus. And he looked round about to see her, that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Amen. I want to go to another set of scripture back in Matthew. And you can kind of hold your spot there in Mark because we're going to be going back to Mark pretty close there. But Matthew chapter 15. I'll call this your Bible exercise today because we're going back and forth a little bit. Matthew chapter 15. Starting at verse 21. It says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the of the same coast and cried unto him saying have mercy on me O Lord thou son of David my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil and he answered her not a word and his disciples came and besought him saying send her away for she crieth after us but he answered and said I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel then came she and worshipped him saying Lord help me but he answered and said it is not meant, or it is not right, to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. I want to go back to Mark chapter 2 starting at verse 1 it says and again he entered into Capernaum after some days and it was noise that he was in the house and straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four, or four people carried him. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay, and Jesus saw their faith. He said, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the sick of palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. 
And I've got one more back in Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. Starting at verse 5. It says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centuria beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say unto this man, Go, and he goes. And to another, Come, and he comes. And to my servant, Do this, and he does it. And Jesus answered it. And Jesus heard it. When Jesus heard it, excuse me, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. There were many needs from many people that were brought before Jesus. All these people came to Jesus with a different need. And you know, they, they had a lot in common. These stories had a lot in common. They had a few differences, right? But they had many things in common. You see, the things they had different, or the things they had in common, is that they all believed that Jesus was enough. They all came amen. in faith. God. They came in faith, amen. And they came in, I might add, a very strong faith. Faith that even made Jesus marvel, saying, such great a faith I've not seen in all of Israel. He's saying, here's this Roman centurion, a non-Jewish person, essentially, and he says, I don't even see the Jews having this kind of faith toward God. He's saying, that's marvelous. That's amazing. But they all came to him in faith and believing that Jesus was enough. Yes. And when they came to Jesus, what they also had, all had in common was that Jesus was able to do for them what nobody else could. Amen. What nobody else could. You look at the woman with the issue of blood. It says she spent 12 years, spent all that she had on physicians and stuff, and was not any better. In fact, she got even worse. But when she came to Jesus, he was enough. He could do it, doing what nobody else could for this woman. Doing what nobody else could for this woman, amen? And when it comes to uh, this woman that came to Jesus and she asked that, that her son would be healed, amen, or her daughter would be healed, and, you know, she was looking to Christ and no other Jew. I, I wonder who else she turned to before she turned to Jesus. But she was turned away essentially by Jesus at first, right? He didn't acknowledge her at first. He knew it was going to happen. But he didn't acknowledge her at first. But he did for her what no other Jew would do, just giving her the time of day. Amen. amen. When she displayed the faith that she had in him, amen, he did what no other Jew would do. And he healed in ways that nobody else could heal for that woman. Amen. Amen. When it came to that man that was lowered down through the roof and they broke off the roof and lowered him down, amen, Jesus did for him what nobody else could. It even made the Jews, the Pharisees and the priests that were there, they marveled. And when he said what he first said, he says, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Well, who in the world can forgive sin? Who does this man think that he is? Well, Jesus can do what no other man can Jesus can do for us what nobody else can do. And he did for that man that was sick of the palsy and in the bed, amen. He did for him what nobody else could do. And he wanted to make it known that he could do what nobody else can do. That's why he said it, amen. He, he was looking to catch some ears with what he said. Jesus has a way of doing that. He likes getting people's attention. He said, thy sins be forgiven. He was waiting. Oh, 
You don't think I can forgive sins? I want you to know I can forgive sins. Now I'm going to go ahead and say, arise and walk. And he rose and walk. And they, maybe they started thinking, maybe it is within the power of this Jesus they call the Christ to forgive sin. Amen. amen. But he could do what nobody else can do. He did for, for the centurion, amen, what nobody else could do. He simply spoke the word. Now, they had healers then. They had physicians then, but you'd have to bring the person to somebody, right? You'd have to say, here they are, they'll give them a diagnosis, they'll look over them, give them some kind of exam. Even, even a, a witch doctor or something, they'd, they'd spit in the air and, and do some kind of chant or whatever, and ha, whatever, right? But to simply just speak the word and they're healed? Nobody else can do that. I don't care. He, you, you go back to what was done in Egypt, right? When he was bringing them up and there was all the plagues. You know, even the Egyptians could mimic some of the plagues that, uh, that God had sent on Egypt, right? But it got to the point where they're like, we can't, we can't do that. Like, the darkness, we, no, we can't make darkness fall upon all the land for three days. You know, they was able to keep up a certain point, And this world can keep up maybe to a certain point. Or at least they think they can. Yes, right. But there comes to a certain point where it's like, no, nobody else can do that but God. Amen. And to simply just speak the word. That's centurion. And, and that's why I think this is the greatest display of faith, amen, that we have in Scripture. Because he says, just speak the word. You know, Jesus did miracles, right? And he performed these miracles in many different ways. I think of how he touched the blind, the blind man, amen, when, when he spit on the ground and he made clay and he put it in their eyes, you know. Did he need to do that? No. There wasn't nothing magical about Jesus' spit. I promise you that. Or that clay. That wasn't... What did he do that for? It's my belief that Jesus did that simply to strengthen that person's faith. Because you know what done it? In all one, each one of these circumstances, they got their healing. They got what they were looking for from Jesus because they had faith. Jesus wasn't even there. When that woman come up and touched the hem of his garment, yeah. Jesus was not actively there to heal. I mean, uh, there, there were many people there, and I'm sure he was going about with the intention to heal those who needed it, right? But he was not actively seeking to heal that woman. Before he even knew she had a need, amen, she was healed. He didn't know there was a need until it had already been met. Why? Because it was her faith. It was her faith that made it possible for her to be healed. It was the faith of those that said, hey, I've got to get G hit this man in the presence of Christ. I've got to break up this roof so he can get in the yeah. presence of Christ. Amen. Amen. It was by faith, by faith, by faith. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So when he says, all you've got to do is speak, and I know it's done, yeah. that is faith. When God's word is enough, amen, because God doesn't need to do some kind of fancy trick, amen. He doesn't need to do some kind of fancy display. It is simply his word. His word has the power to get it done. That's how he made the world, right? He said, let, let, let there be light. Let it be so. He spoke it, amen. His word has power. And that man had faith that Jesus' word was enough. That's a great display of faith. Amen. Amen. They all had faith. They all had faith. And Jesus did for them what nobody else could. Amen. He did for them what nobody else could. But they also had some differences. They were all looking to him in different ways, right? And with different needs. Some... She was just looking to touch Jesus, right? The one was just looking to touch Jesus. Not even Jesus himself, but just his, his clothing, amen? The other one says, I just got to eat from his table, amen? If I could just get a crumb of what he's given out, if I could just get a small portion, I just got to eat a little bit from his table, and I'll get what I need, amen? amen. Seeking him, looking to him in slightly different ways for slightly different needs, amen? But still getting what they needed from him. Amen. The other said, if I could just get in his presence. I can't stay outside the house. I can't stay up on the roof. I got to get down there where he is. If I could just get in his presence. The other one, if I could just, if he'll just say the word. If he'll just say the word, that's enough. But they were all looking to see Jesus. They were all looking to Jesus and 
had faith that he would be enough. Amen? Yes, had faith that he would be enough. And we all have something in common with these four stories. Amen? We all have something in common with these four stories. Amen. We all have needs that nobody else can meet but Jesus. Every single one of us face a need in life or multiple needs in life that nobody else can face, can meet, except for Jesus Christ. Amen? And many people have that need and they don't even know what that need is and that's the need of salvation, amen? Yes, Lord. You see, people, people, I think it's built Praise in within God. us, amen, honestly, that we know that there's something not right and something needs to be yes. made right with our Maker, with God. Amen. And whether, whether we're like Adam and Eve, we might try and cover up our sin. We might try and clothe ourselves, amen, to cover up our own nakedness or our own sin. It won't work. We can't save us. Amen. We can't do it. We might look to different religions. We might look to, to works of righteousness to deliver us, amen, to, to appease God, to say we're good enough. But none of those things will do it. We have a need of salvation, and the only one that can meet that need is Jesus Christ, amen. Through His suffering, through His sacrifice, He met a need that nobody else could, amen. Jimmy can't meet that need for you. I can't meet that need for you, amen. But we can be like those four men that broke up the roof. Amen. And we can help lower you down in the presence of God because it's in His presence where your needs can get met. Amen. Amen. It's not my presence. My presence doesn't make a difference. But I know the one who can make a difference. And when it comes to salvation, and I promise you, if you've not come to Him for salvation, you're in need of it. You're in need of it. Am I calling you a dirty, rotten person no more so than anybody else, including myself? Yes, Lord. We all need salvation, amen. And Jesus is the only one that can meet it, amen. But we run into several other needs in this life. We do. I need peace. And I tell you what, I haven't found it in this world. Jimmy talks about how everybody's looking for love and peace and joy, and we can find it temporarily in this world, sure. And maybe to a certain degree. But not like what I found in Jesus. Yes, Lord. You know, there's a, there's a difference in living and living well. What Jesus would say, I've come to give you life and life Praise more abundantly. God. Amen. People think they know what it means Glory to be living God. without Christ. They have no idea. Amen. They have no idea. We look for joy. We look for peace. We look for love and we find it temporarily in this world, but then we're left longing for it over and over again. But I came to the well that satisfies, amen, amen. I found it in Jesus Christ where he satisfied it in a way that nobody else could. There's love in my life that, that, that comes from him that I can't get from this world. Dr. Phil can't teach you how to have that kind of peace, joy, and love. Trust me. It's in him. It's in Him. Our needs are many. And they change throughout life, right? What I needed 10, 20 years ago, it's not the same needs I have. But you know, no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter what the circumstances of life you're in, no matter what challenges life is bringing your way at this particular time, those things might change, right? It might be a failing marriage. It might be a, a battle against addiction. You, you, there's a need there. Guess what? The need meter does not change. The need meter does not change. And it doesn't matter what that need is, no matter how big we think it is, no matter how small we think it is. Guess what? Christ is there to meet that need. Glory to God. He doesn't He doesn't want to be the second alternative. Does that mean we don't, does that mean don't go to the doctor, just cry out to Jesus? I say, cry out to Jesus, and then sure, go to the doctor. Amen. Put your life Amen. in his hands first before you go putting it in a man's hands. Amen. 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 Sometimes it's the, the doctors that God chooses to use. Amen. Amen. Right. God chose to use Brother Jimmy's kidney to, 
to be put in Sister Debbie's body so she could have life. You know, we don't, I'm not going to bind hands and say, God, you got to work this way. This is the way I want you to do it. And if you got any other plans, I don't want nothing to do with it because this is what I'm expecting. So many people come to God expecting things to be done this way because they think they need X, Y, and Z when they really need A, B, and C. Sometimes God knows what we need a whole lot better. I, I say sometimes, all the times. God knows better what we need than we know ourselves. But if we'll come to Him in faith saying, Lord, this is what I think I need. And I'm asking you for this. But I'm trusting you know better what I need than I know myself. Lord, I give it to you. And I'm trusting whatever the outcome is, whatever, I'm trusting that you're going to take care of it. And that it's going to be good. Because I don't know anything that you've given that is not good. Amen. That's not an easy thing. Amen. Church, I, I want to leave you with a greater faith that God is enough, that Jesus is enough. Amen. It's not the things that he has to offer either. He said, I'll meet all your need. Going back to that first scripture in Philippians, I will meet all your need. Now, I don't know if it's lost in translation or what, but I like how it leaves it singular there, not plural, needs. It says need in the King James. Oh, I will meet all your, or supply all your need according to, to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Because we have one need in this life. I know we said we got many needs, we do, but there is one need that will meet all the other needs. And that is Jesus Christ. He is our one and single only need. And everything else will be met in Him. Look to Him. Draw close to Him. Make Him your everything. And I promise you, if you'll walk with Him, if you'll hold tight to Him, if you'll cling to Him and make Him your number one, I'm telling you, you're not going to be disappointed. You won't be disappointed. I've not been disappointed yet. Now, I've not experienced everything there is to experience in life. So take that for what it is. But... I've not been disappointed. Right. I found that when I approach him in faith, that he satisfies and that he's enough. Yes, Amen. Thank you, Look Jesus. to Christ. Look to Christ and see him as enough. Look to him with anticipation, knowing, just like these four knew, I'm going to touch him and I'm going to be healed. I'm going to get in his presence and I'm going to get what I need. Amen. Whether it's what I think I need or if it's something else. I get what I need when I get close to Him. I don't know how many times I've gone to pray about something thinking this needed to happen, but God done something else, and wow, wow, it was a whole lot better than what I was looking for. Amen. A whole lot better. He's enough, church. He's enough. Brother Jimmy, I'll give it over to you. Brother Will, tonight is uh, give us some good words of encouragement. Some good promises that you and I can hold on to. The best one that he gave you is uh, telling you exactly what your need was, and that's Jesus Christ. There's just one little small thing I want to tell you and we'll close. It's no matter how big your need is. We have a tendency sometimes to put God in a box. He can handle this. He's big enough to take care of this. But you know, I've got this great big one over here this great big problem and I I just don't see how it's going to happen I'm often reminded brother Will of when Jesus was standing there and he had 5,000 men not counting the women and the children to feed and he said to his disciples what we got to eat boys said, I got two little fishes and five loaves of bread. 
I forget which one of the disciples said, we don't have enough. said, but I got two pennies worth, pence worth. I can go buy some more. I don't know what we're going to do. He said, bring it over here to me. And I'll bless it. And he blessed it. And they not only had enough, but they had 12 baskets left over. The difference between what you have and what you need is Christ's blessing. It's Jesus Christ. He's the difference between what you have and what you need. He's it. He is that need meter. He's it today. You may be like the disciple there and I just don't know how we're going to do it. It just ain't enough. You know, I'm. you could say I'm a low down dirty sinner and you've not... I'm here to tell you there ain't nothing the blood can't cover. There ain't not a thing. You may be here today and you got sick and afflicted, whatever your need might be. I can tell you one thing. I can't answer it. Brother Will can't answer it. Brother Johnny, Brother Mark, anybody, Brother De Sister Debbie, that nobody can answer it, but God can. God can meet that need. For just a moment, every head bowed and every eye closed.